Intel NUC12 Extreme, codenamed Dragon Canyon. It's a small form factor PC, but it supports high-end hardware. As the name suggests, Intel 12th Gen CPU, in this instance a Core i9. So that's got a combination of P cores and E cores. We've got support for PCI Express Gen 5 graphics, PCI Express Gen 4 storage. The obvious market is the professional who wants to be able to render CAD and do video editing in their hotel room. And yet for some reason, we have an RGB skull, at the front of the case and we have RGB underglow lighting. Intel, what are you playing at? Over the years Kit Guru has reviewed a number of small form factor PCs including Intel NUX. NUC next unit of computing. So the term is flexible and fluid. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a certain form factor or indeed for a certain function. Indeed, now Intel is selling NUCs that are laptops. So they're bare bones laptops that can be bought by system integrators who want to be able to deliver a high end laptop with the minimum of R&D and hassle and obviously at the same time selling Intel hardware. I reviewed an Intel NUC back in the midst of the time six or seven years ago that was a pre-built from Dino PC. In essence, it was some laptop hardware running on integrated graphics, uh, but unlike a laptop, you didn't have the screen or the keyboard or the batteries, so therefore it was cheaper. You had to find a power socket, you had to plug it into external monitor, mouse and keyboard, but you can follow the logic, take the laptop hardware, and put it in a different form factor. Over time, that approach has changed in line with the thought of next unit of computing. It's not a static thing. In May 2020, Luke reviewed the Ghost Canyon NUC 9 Extreme, which uses a soldered laptop Core i9 9980HK processor. However, it is installed in a separate compute unit, which communicates with the rest of the system over PCI Express. So you can see the laptop hardware is being used in a different way. And this was illustrated in James's mega epic knock mod of Ghost Canyon in January 2021. That's a five-parter, well worth watching. You can see the knock compute unit, you can see the alternate Cooler Master chassis, you can see exactly how the system works. James sweated blood over that system and ended up with a custom loop on an Intel NUC. Nicely done, James. And the point with James's build and Luke's review is that those systems had discrete graphics. We moved away from the original NUC, integrated everything, therefore by definition low power, to something that's completely different. It can do professional work, or be used for gaming, or a bit of both, of course. Naturally, this means the price has also gone up, and so too has the size. It's been a criticism from some reviewers of NUC that over time, the size has increased. But let's be reasonable here. The same is true of games consoles. Sony PlayStation 3, out of the arc. The PS4, about the same size, but it's much more angular. And now we have the PlayStation 5, which is a huge, great unit because it's high power and has an enormous cooling system inside. And the same is true of Microsoft and their Xboxes. The new Xbox Series X is similar to the PlayStation 5. AMD APU, about 150 watts, and a hefty great big cooling system. We're going to do a tour of the NUC12 Extreme on the outside before we go inside. Lots of ventilated panels. On this side, the graphics card is breathing in through this panel. On this side, the power supply is intaking air. We've got three fans in the roof, 92mm fans, that are exhausting air. On the front, we have one USB Type-C, one USB Type-A, an SD card slot, and an audio jack. The rear I.O. on the compute unit, we have 10 gigabit Ethernet by Aquantia, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet from Intel, 6 USB 3 Type-A, and 2 Thunderbolt 4. Internally, we have Wi-Fi 6E. Let's take a look inside the NUC12 Extreme. So you can buy it as a bare bones or as a configured PC. This has been supplied to us for review as a built system by Intel. Indeed, I believe it's actually built by our Intel rep himself. Four screws at the back. Off with that panel.
The chassis appears to be absolutely identical to the previous generation, 11th gen. However, as I didn't see that myself, um, I'm relying on pictures and specs and such like, but all the measurements and everything comes out the same. Uh, eight litre capacity, should you wonder. And then we pull the side panel. Right, graphics card, obviously not included in a bare bones. Power supply is included in the bare bones. And then, and the top swings open to give you access to the graphics card. So we've got three 92 mil fans, all controlled off the Intel software. Single screw, flip that down. Now we have access, teeny teeny. I'm looking for a latch for the Oh, all right. You do have to go through the front. This is a graphics card. Just thought I'd mention that it's such a rarity in this day and age. The power supply is an FSP 650 watt. Funny thing is, it looks like a 12 VO unit, but I'm assured it is not because the baseboard requires 3.3 and 5 volts. So 12 volt is the main part of its function, but while this looks like a 12 VO, it ain't. So there we have just a piece of plastic, it's just a shroud so the system can draw air in from the back. Oh yes, Wi-Fi antenna. Compute unit, release two screws on the top of the compute unit and pry away this plastic cover, which is essentially glued in with thermal pads. And there we go. So this essentially is a motherboard uh, complete with processor, cooler, M.2 SSDs and memory on a PCI Express riser. Oh yes, around the back we have another slot so if you choose to add a third SSD, you can. The 12th gen NUC has ditched support for SATA. So it's M.2 all the way. And clearly when this card is installed in the system, that hatch is actually available through there. So doing an upgrade to your storage uh, would actually be quite straightforward. But there we go. That is the... How hard would it be for me to pull off that cooler? Give me a second. Intel clearly doesn't want you to take off the cooler. Uh, the back plate comes away, which reveals a few screws, which means you can then unplug, I guess that's the CMOS battery. And that gives you a bit more access. Like that. Also shows us incidentally on the back of the board, we have the chipset, uh, CPU backplate, and also the Wi-Fi card. That's the vapor chamber cooler. That is to cool the Aquantia chip, I have no doubt, and those are your VRM coolers. And that is what it looks like. A good dollop of Tim on that processor. And it is indeed a fully socketed desktop processor. Right. We're in the Intel NUC Studio software, which controls the NUC, just as the name suggests. LEDs, skull, bottom front right and left so we can set those as we see fit let's turn uh, rainbow off and off 
quite slow to respond. Off. And the skull will have that off. So there we have it. Steady red underglow in three sections and the skull is now off. So the front of the NUC is blank. Performance mode. The CPU is in custom mode. The fans are in balanced mode. And here we can see what that means. We've got four power modes. Low power, 35 watt, which would be ridiculous for a Core i9. Boosting to 109 watts, tau 28 seconds. Balanced mode, which is the default we are told for systems. Uh, 55 watts, 109 watt boost, 28 seconds. Max performance, 65 watts, which is uh, correct as far as I'm concerned for this processor. Custom, I haven't set this profile. This is how this system arrived with me. 65 watts, boosting to 221 watts and tau of 28 seconds. I'll leave it in balance mode because Intel tells me that's how they wanted things tested, but obviously I have also tried maximum performance. And then we have the options for the fans. You can see that at the moment, one of the fans is rotating, two of them are static, and you can move your, so pick a profile, quiet, balanced, cool, or custom. Uh, again, I haven't done thing with the custom mode, so that's essentially trying to get the process to operate at relatively low temperature for a Core i9. Uh, and then it's going to kick in reasonably hard. Let's leave it on balance mode and go home. And let's have a look at a game. The problem, of course, in showing you gaming performance in charts is that this combination of Core i9-2900K and RTX 3070 is a new one to me. So I'm going to simply show you gameplay. We're in Far Cry 6, we're at 1440p, ultra quality settings, and off we go. And I'm going to be quiet and you can listen to the fan noise and admire the eye candy. Clearly the cooling system is audible, frame rate very respectable. Obviously that's mainly down to the graphics card, the RTX 3070, however the NUC has delivered. Let's look at benchmarks for the NUC. We're looking here at CPU and system benchmarks because the graphics card is not part of the bare bones. In Bapco Crossmark it doesn't make much difference whether you're in 55 or 65 watt mode, the system does okay. When we strip out the other test results and just look at Core i9, you can see that the hybrid nature of the Alder Lake processor means that this low powered 12900 beats the Core i9-11900K quite handily. Moving on to the pure grunt test of Cinebench R23, we can see that in 55 watt mode, the NUC falls to the bottom of our chart. In 65 watt mode, it climbs very slightly, and that puts us in contention with the Core i9 10th and 11th gens. 12th gen and the big Ryzen's are completely out of reach. Cinebench R23 single core mode, this is interesting, as you'd expect. Limiting the power doesn't make a lot of difference in single core mode, and as a consequence, the NUC performs perfectly well. The CPU part of 3D Mark Time Spy, the NUC does okay, but it's certainly not brilliant. In Blender, if we look at CPU temperatures, we can see that the NUC is running nice and cool. In 65 watt mode, 71 degrees. In 55 watt mode, i.e. lower power, 73 degrees. Sounds counterintuitive. The fans are running at slower speed in 55 watt mode, but essentially the temperature therefore is pretty much the same in both modes. Power draw in Cinebench R23 for the system, very low indeed. 127 watts in 55 watt mode, 140 watts in 65 watt mode. Compared to a full on gaming PC, the NUC is barely consuming any power at all. What do I think of the Intel NUC 12 Extreme? 
Clearly this is a showcase for a 65 watt Core i9 Alder Lake processor with a combination of P cores and E cores. And that part of it works very well, indeed impressively so. In terms of performance, the processor in this system manages to kick uh, relatively recent Core i9s uh, despite running on significantly less power. That's good. However, that doesn't feature in my pros and cons because in terms of buying a product, kind of so what? Uh, so the NUC has demonstrated to me that Alder Lake has legs. It makes me keenly interested to see what Intel does with the imminent 13th gen, which is going to give you more e-cores. And then as they change architectures and expand the concept of the hybrid processor, I think it's going to go very nicely indeed for Intel. So that's part of my takeaway from this NUC, but that doesn't feature in the pros and cons, which are as follows. Small form factor that supports a full-size GPU. Obviously it does. Good airflow and cooling. The case is a nice piece of work. I mean, it's a, it's a continuation of the previous gen, uh, but it works well. I like it. The three fans in the roof. Good job, Intel. Dual Thunderbolt 4 ports. In terms of I.O., this system, it's good. And similarly, 10 gigabit and 2.5 gigabit Ethernet and also Wi-Fi 6E. Connectivity? Oh yeah. Cons, and this is hideously predictable of me, it's very expensive. I don't know the exact price of the bare bones, I know it's a lot. £1,200 or £1,400 plus the parts you need to make it into a system. You're looking at between two and two and a half thousand pounds for this PC as it sits here. And that is a lot. It comes under the heading of, if you had to buy it, no thanks. If your work gives it to you, yes indeed. DDR4 memory, I think this is a bit short-sighted. I mean, Intel doubtless wanted to use DDR5. There's availability problems, there's cost problems. Nonetheless, I think DDR4, a bit short-sighted. And then the RGB lighting. To me, it's misplaced and it's unnecessary. But it's a small detail because you can turn it off. Overall, the NUC 12 Extreme. Impressive, horribly expensive. Are you going to buy it? I doubt it.